Let us pray. Almighty God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Illumine our way this morning that we might walk in your way and in your truth and in your life that we might hear your word and live it through your spirit, in the name of your Son. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Please join me in our Pew Bible on page 1011. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I was fresh out of seminary young and naive, full of great ideas and very little life experience. 
and they set me loose on a church. God bless that church in Arkansas. I had been there two months. Two months. And I get a phone call from one of the elders in the church that uh, I should have known. He's kind of a joker. Uh, I did learn that after uh, this experience. This was one of our early experiences in getting to know each other. And Charlie calls me on the phone and he says, well, pastor, you've been here about two months. I think it's time for you to go to jail. I said, excuse me? And he starts laughing, and he, he said, no, no, we're not going to throw you in jail. We'll, we'll let you out. But no, seriously, though, Charlie says, I need you to go visit someone. Really? Okay. Tell me a little bit so I kind of know what I'm walking into. And Charlie tells me the story of a man, we'll call him Mitch. Tells me the story of Mitch, who is a successful professional. He's lived a good life. He's provided for his family, for his wife and his two teenage, teenage daughters. He got mixed up a few months ago before this event, a few months previously in methamphetamine. A friend of his had told him that if you're careful and only take small amounts, you can work and work and work. You'll be more productive than you've ever been before in your life. And Mitch tried it, and he found himself with his life ruined and in jail. It's amazing sitting in a classroom in seminary talking about things. It's another thing to go visit someone whose life is completely broken And you hear that big steel door slam behind you. I was not there to judge Mitch. My job in that moment was to listen. This was the first time he had met his pastor. And I had met him. And it was the worst moment in his life. I listened a lot. And we prayed. And then I was able to go home. And he was not. It was an eye-opening experience for me. It was something that I had never done before. I had never been on the inside of a jail. I hope I never am again. But I tell you what, when you see someone at their worst and at their lowest, and you hear their story and you realize that it is simply a few small steps, that can take someone who is living a good and faithful life with just a few small steps, it's all destroyed. And it was at that moment that I heard these sheep and goats in my heart. This moment, these least of these that Jesus is speaking of, that is exactly what I was experiencing in that moment. 
The interesting thing is, in this parable, Jesus is telling this teaching story. He is describing how God, as a king, is going to judge nations. And how he's going to judge the peoples. This is a plural thing, nations. These are collections and groups of people, not necessarily individuals, but every individual has a part to play. But this judging is dangerous business. It's the king in the story who does the judging. Not the sheep, not the goats. That was one of the things I walked away with after my experience with Mitch. I walked away realizing, oh my goodness, with a few choices here and there made a little bit different, any one of us could have found ourselves in his situation. Maybe not the exact circumstances, but it doesn't take much. So I was, as I said, not there to judge him. That was not my role. I was there to remind him of the love of God and to remind him that if he seeks God's forgiveness, he'll find it. And he'll be restored and made anew and have a new chance at life. I couldn't promise him what that life would look like. I couldn't promise him that his wife and his daughters were going to have him back home when and if he got out. I couldn't promise him that the road ahead was not going to be tough and grueling. All I could do was be with him and remind him that God's with him. The judging was not up to me. You see, the problem with sheep and goats is that they are finicky animals. They do their own thing. They sometimes listen, they sometimes don't. They, if you were to ask a sheepdog, they would probably tell you they are an uncooperative lot. If a sheepdog ever tells you, let me know. (laughs) Jesus uses the imagery of sheep again and again in referring to his own people. It's not often actually a compliment. Actually, it isn't. (laughs) And yet, it is fitting. Because it's very easy for us to find ourselves in this story. Either being one of the sheep at the right hand who are blessed and told that they will inherit the kingdom prepared before them simply because they showed mercy to someone else. Or there's the goats on the other side who did not show mercy who did not love, who did not show kindness and tenderness, did not simply feed someone who was hungry. And Jesus' response to them, and these will go away into eternal punishment. That's harsh. It's interesting that in Christianity today, we tend to think about um, hellfire and damnation based on moral judgments, right? We tend to think on 
choosing right and wrong, not necessarily about how we treat one another. And this is one of the reasons I love this reading, is that Jesus reminds us that how we treat one another, how we treat the least of these, matters. It matters not only to them, to those who are hungry, to those who are sick, to those who are in prison, to those who are poor. It matters to us. I want to tell you a little more about Mitch. That was not the last time I saw Mitch. I went back and visited him a few more times while he was in the county jail. And then eventually I was able to go visit him at home. And I visited with his family. He began the long process toward healing and reconciliation, not only in himself and in his body with his addiction, but also with his family with his wife, and with his daughters. And if you were to ask him to this day, he would tell you, he would tell you that I saved him. And I argued with him multiple times about that. I said it was not me. It was Jesus. You see, the only reason that I came to visit you was because I am a follower of Jesus. That's why I was there. And the only reason I had any hope to offer you in the midst of one of the worst moments of your life was because I have found hope in Jesus. I wish I could say I knew what Mitch was doing today. But I have hope. I have hope that he is not only doing well today, but that he is doing what others have done for him. That he is continuing to care for and love and nurture the least of these. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our affirmation of faith, which comes from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. Let us affirm our faith in God through the words of the prophet Micah. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with all of us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.